Let's go ahead and have a seat. We'll um, just remember your fellowships. Uh, your fellowships are next week, okay? So next Monday. And uh, it's good to see everybody back. Happy New Year. And uh, all, your, all the guys here in the satellites, uh, glad, to, glad to know that you're back. And um, let's go ahead and pray. We'll get into, get into the lecture. Father, we thank you uh, for the break that we've had and the rest. And we thank you for being able to recharge and come back strong uh, this new year. And Father... Uh, we know that you want us to get into your word, but we also know that you want your word to get into us, more importantly. And so, Father, that's why we're here, to study your word and, and to, uh, for it to become real and, and active in our lives and uh, guide us. So we ask that you would teach us, lead us tonight. Uh, show us those important things about this lesson uh, that apply to each one of us. Pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. So, <clears throat> uh, tonight's lesson is 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 a very very important lesson. It's a very thought provoking one as well. Um, just think about it. as you look at your life uh, over the uh, over the last two years, two and a half years, in light of this COVID pandemic, and I think I think you and everyone else has most likely examined and reevaluated uh, what is important to you, right? What do you treasure? And we'll be talking about that tonight, right? But, I mean, you know, you, you, your family, your, your uh, career or your business, uh, your health, your financial situation, and, and most likely, uh, I would say, your, your spiritual condition. You look at that too, uh, where you stand with God, with the person of Jesus Christ. Um, with the increased risk of death and the death that we've seen associated with, with COVID, um, you more than likely have pondered about what will happen to you if you die. I think uh, we, we think of, we've thought about that more probably because of this pandemic. Uh, is there a God? Is there a heaven? Is there hell? Uh, is there really such thing as eternal life? Uh, what, will happen, what will that life look like if there is? Is there hope in a Savior? So putting our lives in perspective is one thing this pandemic has definitely caused us to do. To think about more than what this world has to offer, to think about spiritual things, to think about eternal truths, uh, those things that have everlasting uh, and eternal value and purpose. And so the Bible is clear, as we see in tonight's lesson, the Bible is clear um, that those who align themselves with Jesus and treasure what is His will be saved. Those who align themselves uh, and, uh, and don't will be lost in the end. It's pretty clear, pretty clear. So we're going to see in our passage here tonight Jesus' unstoppable kingdom and how it's growing as believers like you and I share the truth about Jesus with, every, with uh, those that we come in contact with despite the opposition that's out there uh, and the infiltration of Satan into not only, uh, you know, our culture, but uh, every part of our culture, really, and, 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 and even parts of the church. Um, and so my aim tonight is this, that my, my aim is that we would all learn and know for certain that nothing in this life is more important than Christ and His kingdom. Nothing in this life is more important than Christ and His kingdom. So let's look at our first division tonight, uh, 13, 31 through 35, and we'll read verse uh, 31 through 32 uh, to begin with. 
Uh, this is about the parables of the mustard seed and the yeast. He told them another parable. The, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all of our seeds, of your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. So I think, first of all, we need to define uh, what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God, right? Because there's, there are different opinions about what the kingdom of God is. But simply put, it's a world that emulates heaven. It's a world that emulates heaven. Where God reigns supreme over all of the earth, it, it also refers to the kingdom of Jesus, where one day God will establish his kingdom and reign uh, without rival until he returns. But for now, God is still building his kingdom in the lives of people who receive Jesus as their king. So it's the realm also where God's spirit resides in the hearts of believers like you and I. And it offers a preview of what is to come. So Jesus' truth about the kingdom uh, he's, he's starting to reveal more secrets about the kingdom, okay? Notice that Jesus didn't explain this parable. Why? Why? Well, he's teaching this hidden truth to those who believe in him, okay? And as an act of grace and judgment, his veiled teaching concealed truth from the unbelieving, so the emphasis is on the growth of the kingdom in this parable. From a small, humble beginning to one that fills the whole earth and has an impact and is beneficial to the world. And there, there are different interpretations. Um, we, we, you talked about that in your lesson tonight. Both have direct teaching for, for us. Uh, I, I would note that, want you to note that the key is under, in understanding the Bible is consistency when you're, when you're interpreting Scripture. Consistency, okay, with the Word of God. So, first of all, Jesus compared the mustard seed to what? The kingdom of heaven, right? And as in the parable of the soils, the mustard seed may be the Word of God. It could be the church or individual Christians. But what's the man, the man who plants the mustard seed? Is it Jesus? The Son of Man, okay? It's one interpretation. The field, the field is the world. That's where he's planting it, right? The tree, in a positive way, grows. God's kingdom grows, right? To become this tree. And so the spread of Christianity provides a haven of rest for those who will come. Now, what about the birds? What about the birds here in this parable? They could be non-Jews, Gentiles, who come to be part of God's kingdom. Or, from a negative point of view, they could be the evil one. They could be the birds that picked up the seed, remember, on the path in the sower par parable. These, quote, professing birds, people uh, that use Christianity, you know, to further their own selfish interest and agenda. Uh, like Judas, for instance. It could be that these uh, have invaded, these, this tree has been invaded by those with false or uh, profession or teaching. That could be what these evil birds are. So in any case, this parable shows the power of the gospel when it's sent into the world. That's a fact. And it, show, and it shows the outward, unstoppable growth of Christianity. Now, the lie, the lie that we often fall to is that God's kingdom, His kingdom growth depends on us. It doesn't depend on you and I. We're just partners with Him. Who, who does the saving? God does, right? We plant the seed. Somebody comes along and waters that seed for that person. But God, God is the one who makes this grow. Uh, we believe that 
our identity and worth is determined by our contribution to the kingdom. But the truth is, men, the truth is, is that God is the one that grows his kingdom. In his kingdom, you and I are part of something much greater, and he calls us to share the good news of the gospel uh, one relationship at a time. And we can trust God to accomplish his kingdom purposes uh, as we yield to his leading in our lives. So the next parable, something out of the kitchen, all right? The yeast, the yeast. Uh, what does yeast do? It intensifies a transformation in, in whatever it's in, okay? In, in, in this uh, case, the dough. Um, it permeates the dough. And we'll read in 33 through 35, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled that was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So he starts, uh, the yeast uh, of the dough starts out small, but it becomes great. And that reveals an internal condition of the, of the dough. What are some things about yeast that you know? It's powerful, but its work is invisible, right? The effect, it permeates the dough. Uh, and the point here is that adding yeast changes the character of the dough. It changes the character of the dough. So what is Je Jesus trying to communicate to his disciples or to, to us in this parable? The gospel has the power to change those who receive it individually and worldwide. And the emphasis here, again, is not so much on the rapid growth, but how it works its way in. From little comes much. From little comes much. Okay? Here's another interpretation, uh, which I think is, is uh, the one that I think most theologians would, uh, would uh, agree with that the yeast represents not good, but evil. Think about that. And the warning here is against hidden evil. The fact that Satan is trying to infiltrate God's church, right? 33 is a key verse in this chapter, and one of the key verses in the Bible. Think about it. When leaven or yeast occurs 98 times in the Bible, 70, um, 75 times in the Old Testament and 23 times in the New Testament, yeast is always used in a negative sense. In a negative sense. So symbolism in Scripture doesn't contradict itself. The gospel is represented by the large amount of flour or meal, and the meal comes from the seed, the sower, the seed, the word of God. And when that happens uh, to the word of God, which is represented by the flour of the meal, the woman works it into the dough, the scripture tells us, right? Well, when woman is used in a doctrinal sense, it's, it's used as a principle of evil. Principle of evil which contaminates the dough. So what we see here is Jesus warning that false teachers of every description put leaven in the dough in the Word of God. Don't we see that today? Okay? The prosperity gospel, right? We see it in, 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 in other uh, forms as well. Uh, how we've, we've watered down the Word of God, okay, we pick and choose what we want to believe about the Word of God and, 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 and different, even in different denominations. False doctrine he's talking about here, such as the Pharisees and, and, uh, uh, and uh, the Sadducees, and we see it today too. Satan, the fact is, men, Satan is always trying to attack. He's always trying to discredit. He's always trying to subvert God's message and his people. And Jesus knows this, 
And he knows it's going to continue even today. Today. So the, the intrusion of wrong doctrine into the church will finally lead to total apostasy at, at the time that he returns. These thoughts that Jesus is revealing here have never been revealed like this in the Old Testament either. They were unexpected. You know, we, we talk about that's our, uh, the, the, the uh, theme for this year is unexpected king. But these were unexpected words from an unexpected king to people who would listen to him that, that believed in him. So is the church today, could you consider the church today a mustard tr tree filled with a lot of dirty birds? Yeah, yeah. There are some. And I would suggest that the point that Jesus is making here is that the kingdom of God will grow and expand and extend through the entire world in its final form despite the fact that evil will permeate it because God is unstoppable. He's unstoppable. And I think the common concept or idea here presented by Jesus is that something that seems so small and insignificant can grow and have an unexpected impact. So my first principle is that the growth of Christ kingdom is unstoppable. The growth of Christ's kingdom is unstoppable. Think about it. From Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden to the present time, it seems that the spread of sin, the spread of evil, the growth of hatred, racism, murder, violence, oppression, uh, violation of human rights, um, COVID virus, all these viruses, it seems like it's unstoppable, right? But in the midst of all this conflict and evil is Christ in his church. We see the exponential growth of God's kingdom in the hearts of his people uh, as they share the good news of Christ with others. There is always going to be the constant presence of an infiltration of evil that subverts Christianity. But in the end, God and his church and his people will ultimately prevail because his kingdom is unstoppable. Why is God's kingdom unstoppable? Because he is unstoppable. Nothing that Satan can throw at God will prevent God's plan and purpose, purposes from happening. When, it's all unsaid, when all is said and done, when the final curtain falls, everything, everything that God has promised in his word will be fulfilled to the letter. Well, how is Christ's kingdom growing in you? And how are you helping to grow his kingdom, to spread his word? Where is God asking you to find contentment in him rather than in your performance for him? And what yeast, what yeast of this world or false teaching or doctrine have you bought into uh, your thinking or your living? And what steps are you taking to recognize that and deal with it? Well, our second division, 1344 through 46, Jesus' parables of the treasure and the pearl. After Jesus tells the, these parables to the crowd, he goes into the house with his disciples and he tells them two more parables. These two parables have to do with priorities. Okay, priorities. Both the treasure and the pearl teach the same lesson. The same lesson. And it illustrates the incomparable value and preciousness of the gospel and, and the believer. So as we read in 34 through 40, or 44 through 46, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy... He went and sold all he had and bought the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything he had and he bought it. Again, no explanation given. So you could have more than one meeting here. Um, let's, look at the, let's look at the man and the merchant. That could be a person who is seeking personal fulfillment and he finds it in knowing God. 
those who believe and receive God's gift of salvation. Okay? Or it could be interpreted both the man and the merchant represent the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The treasure and the pearl... What would be the treasure and the pearl here? Well, the treasure and the pearl would be the realm of God's rule. It could be people, you and I, believers, right? We're his treasure that he died for. Israel is often described as God's treasured possession. But I would suggest to you that the pearl of great price, instead of being found by accident, is found by one whose business is to seek to seek it out, and who finds it just in the way of searching for those treasures. So the man and the merchant here, the man and the merchant here could also be Jesus, who lovingly and willingly gave his life and paid it all to redeem or buy back those who were lost. The pearl in this explanation is a growing organism, a body of all believers which is a treasure for Christ, okay? We're his bride, so we're treasured by him. And my second principle is this. Seeking Christ and his kingdom is more important than anything else. Seeking Christ and his kingdom is more important than anything else. Is there no greater treasure than Christ, the kingdom of God, having the Holy Spirit live within, within us? There's no greater treasure. Francis, Francis Chan, American Protestant author and teacher and preacher, maybe you've read some of his books, he says our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Let that sink in. Our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. We've all seen, read, heard about those people who seek wealth or pleasure or comfort or fame above anything else and everything else. And their whole lives are centered around those things while they ignore and dismiss the spiritual things of life. And we find that in the end, many of those that I'm speaking about openly confess that they were duped by the world's thinking of success and fulfillment. And after all their vain toil, striving for these things, in the end, they're empty and alone. And those things that should have, that were promised by the world to bring them joy and purpose and contentment and peace failed. Perhaps you tend to camp out there. Maybe you're not completely sold out to this world and its values and promises, but you still have one foot in the world and one foot with Jesus. With the Lord's help, as you earnestly seek Him more and more, His Spirit will begin to give you a different perspective and rearrange your priorities so that you'll understand that seeking Him and His kingdom is more important than anything else because He and His kingdom is the greatest treasure that we'll ever, ever have. So what's most important to you? What's most important to you? If Jesus Christ is your Savior and King and your relationship with Him uh, is that important, how does your life reflect it? Your priorities, your activities, your thoughts, your prayer time, your love for others. What might you be seeking that has no real eternal value 
Will you choose to put away those things that have no value in his kingdom? And if you've never surrendered to Jesus, to his call to salvation, if you've never accepted him as your savior and king, why not? Because God's word gives us enough evidence. His word gives you enough evidence that Jesus is who he says he is. I would ask that you would let today, this, in this new year, be a new beginning. And you would choose today to turn towards God in hope because he offers forgiveness of sins, eternal life, eternal security, peace, contentment, and a purpose, a purpose for your life. Our last division, uh, 47 through 52, Jesus explains the believer's responsibility in his hometown, then he gets rebuked in his hometown. So after encouraging his listeners through these four parables, Jesus warns his disciples, and we read in 47 through uh, uh, 50, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and they sat down and they collected the good fish in baskets. They threw the bad fish away. Uh, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels, the angels, that's cool, huh? The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's comparing judgment, God's judgment on all people at the end of the age to a fishnet. A net that's cast out. And the kingdom is like a net, the kingdom of heaven in its broadest sense. Okay? It's thrown out there. This net is thrown out there. Those who profess Christ, we have mixed peoples in this kingdom, right? And we have we're gonna have judgment. The lake is the world. The lake is the world. The fish, Christians. And those who profess to be Christians but aren't. Okay? So you have the good fish and the bad fish. The good fish being the born again, saved, redeemed people of God. The bad fish being the lost, the unsaved, those who are still under God's wrath. Then they pull in the net at the end of the time when Christ returns, when God will. It's a time when God will judge all men. And we see the outcome for these two types of fish. The fishermen here are the angels, right? Okay, they're the ones that, that are doing the fishing. So we have this separation and this judgment that takes place. And the harvest represents judgment in both of these parables. The wicked from the righteous, the saved from the unsaved, believers, unbelievers, right? So it's the sin of unbelief. That's what separates a person from God. It's a person that doesn't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the son of God. He is our savior, our redeemer. The fiery furnace denotes, I think, the fierceness and the intensity of the torment of those that reject Christ. The gnashing of teeth, I think, graphically describes the despair and anger of those who have denied Christ and realized their choice. And the horrible judgment and sentence, this eternal pun punishment, is what this is. And there will be no appeal, right? We're not going to have a lawyer that's going to appeal this. So Jesus is clear. Very clear in this parable. That the, the, the people that reject him in unbelief will be lost. Will be, will be lost. But people that receive him and are saved and believe in him and trust in him will be, will be saved.
So he goes on to talk about the new treasures, the new treasures, bringing out the new treasures and the old treasures. Think about in your own life, your testimony. Your toast testimony is a treasure. The Bible, the Old Testament, the, the new, you know, all of these are old treasures. Your, pers- your uh, former experiences are uh, with Christ and how He has sustained you or led you or comforted you. Those are personal experiences. Those are treasures that you can share with other people. And that's what we, he, he wants us to do. He wants us to always apply those and share those. Um, and I think what he's saying as far as these treasures go, that we should never neglect the old treasures of God when acquiring the new ones, you know, because those will speak to someone uh, in some way. And our life in Christ is like a house full of treasures that we're supposed to give out and not hoard. And I think the key point here is that true disciples don't hide their treasures of truth, do we? We don't hide them. Put it, put it in another way, those whom in Christ reside must not hide their spiritual treasures. So we're, we're responsible uh, to handle wisely the spiritual truth that God has uh, uh, given us. So now we go and we see that just like Christ has been talking about, even in his hometown, even with all the miracles that, he's, that they've seen, they still have uh, people that reject him, right? Even in his hometown. And so that continues today. People, family members, friends, co-workers, they take offense at Christ and they can take offense at you and I because they know us. They know who we are. They live with us, right? They know that we're not perfect, okay? And so they see our flaws, they see our humanness, and yet and they have a tendency to discount our testimony or discount our uh, beliefs uh, in Christ. But Jesus, but we can trust Jesus. We can trust him and we, could, we can uh, continue to share Christ with others, both, the, both our old experiences and our new experiences. Those that we've learned from uh, Bible study fellowship, for instance, for coming to this study, other Bible studies that you've come to. So my third principle is this. At the end of the age, God will judge. Those that oppose Christ will be lost and those who trust him will be saved. At the end, there will be a judgment. We're used to getting judged, right? We're just used to getting judged. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote, wrote this. In the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out their past sins at all cost, give them a fresh start. He goes on to say, but God has done so already on Calvary. Jesus died for their sins. He wiped them away. He has forgiven them, but they didn't accept his forgiveness and gift. So if Jesus is the resurrection and the life, rejecting him is eternal death. That's what uh, C.S. Lewis wrote. The good news, the good news is that we have a choice and we have a magnificent alternative to death. The good news is that we have Jesus. And when we have Jesus, we have all we need. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, these parables are so important to our eternal salvation. And Father, we... We just praise you as the source of all truth and power. We praise you as sovereign over life and death, that your kingdom has no end, is unstoppable. And my prayer is that we all would seek first your kingdom, that we would make this new year one of renewal, one of transformation, 
one of commitment and faithfulness, one focused steadfastly and fixed on you. Father, let us receive the new thing that you are going to do in and through us this year and help us to, to live lives that are pleasing to you. And may we treasure you above everything else as you treasure us, your people, because nothing in this life is more important in Christ and his kingdom. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. See you, man. Have a great week, and uh, remember fellowships next Monday night.